So everybody, thanks so much for listening to us. If you're listening to us for the first time, at the bottom of the screen, there is a little subscribe button. Please click on that to subscribe so we get this interview out to as many people as possible. We try to interview different people from all different backgrounds about all different topics. And we want these interviews to get out to as many people as possible. So again, please subscribe, YouTube, Facebook, and also on the podcasting sites. We really appreciate that. So we are getting into a, 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 you know, a subject that's really hot off the press. I mean, a lot of people have been pushing for this to happen for a long, long time. And unfortunately, it hasn't happened all over the country, but it has happened uh, in a few states. So we're grateful for that. And we're talking about the legalization of marijuana, but we'll talk about that and also how to grow marijuana. We have Ed Rosenthal. He's on to talk about his new book. It is Cannabis Growers Handbook, The Complete Guide to Marijuana and Hemp. So Ed, first of all, thanks so much for taking time to come on. It's an important topic, like I said, and we hope that the young viewers learn a lot from this. Oh, well, thank you for having me. All right, so Ed, what made you want to get involved in this industry in general and write the book? Well, I've been writing uh, books about marijuana for uh, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book uh, was uh, is a culmination of a lot of my research and then uh, uh, other people's also, since uh, uh, I had uh, a... Uh, uh, PhD in, uh, uh, in uh, plant biology uh, working with me that was Rob Flannery and we had the help of uh, professors and uh, uh, researchers from all over the country about 12 PhDs helped with the book and many people in the industry and why I wanted to get into it well you know I'm not as interested in the industry as I am in the plant and helping people to grow the plants. So um, the industry can come and go, but people will be always be growing cannabis. Can we talk about how cannabis changes lives? I mean, we hear all this talk about the opioid crisis, which is still going on in our country. And these pharmaceutical companies, which own our government, are trying to push pills on people where they may be able to just do something natural and smoke a plant or get edibles and it'll help them with many different health uh, issues that they're suffering with. Why do you feel like this is such, you know, I guess the pharmaceutical industry, I, and I'll ask if you agree with this, has that hold on the government as far as that goes that we can't have, everybody, I guess I should say, doesn't have the choice to either use marijuana or not? Well, the majority of people in the United States uh, can uh, live in areas where they can use it medically. Mm -hmm. And right. it's a near majority of people who live in areas where it's legal to use rec recreationally. Now, I don't agree with you that it's been the pharmaceutical companies that have okay. been holding it up because when I've gone to... Uh, both uh, political meetings and scientific meetings, I found that the main uh, opposition to it seems to be from uh, the different uh, uh, agencies like the DEA and NIMH and other uh, government regulatory, regulatory agencies rather than the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, you had another question in there. It was, uh, uh, you know, uh, you were comparing uh, uh, the cannabis as benign, uh, uh, people's benign reaction to cannabis as compared with, with the opioids. Yeah. And it's like this. If you ask most people who use opioids or stimulants like cocaine or speed right. or anything like that, well, do you think this doing this has been good for you? Well, if they were going to give you an honest answer, and most would, yeah. they'd say, no, don't get into it. It hasn't been good for me. It's ruined my life or it's hurt my life. And on the other hand, uh, if you ask cannabis users whether it's been a contribution to their lives, 
most of them, whether they are using it at the present time or used it in the past, would say, no, it has not been a detriment to my life. It's been a positive thing in my life. It helped me through, or I still, I use it. It's part of my life. And so I think there's the self-evaluation by users is, is really um, uh, poignant because it's what it's saying is that people who use cannabis feel, don't feel that they have a, for the most part, don't feel that they have a problem with it, except maybe it's too expensive. Right. So, Ed, you know, I grew up in a Catholic background, Catholic school. They preach against all this stuff. Uh, marijuana is bad. It's like the devil's drug, blah, 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 blah. But can we go into this, though? Why do you feel like, because it does feel like, and I agree with you on the DEA and these governmental organizations that are really trying to step on uh, marijuana from making it fully legal across the country in general, as far as recreational. But my thing is, is there still a stigma in America or is it just a very small well, stigma in different parts? Well, well, this whole thing about the Catholic Church, I don't think that the Catholic Church can say anything about any kind of moral or ethical issue. Correct. They, they, I mean, it's a bunch of uh, pedophiles that are running the church and um, they're still in it. They're still doing it. You know, if you look, if you look at, they built a big cathedral in Oakland, California. And you know what it looks like from one angle? It looks like a woman's vulva. <laughs> I, I agree you know, with you, you know, 100%. And I, I keep saying this is just another example of getting fucked by San Francisco because, you know, you, you have the Salesforce Tower there and yeah. then you have this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but what do you think Jesus was doing in the desert all that time? Yeah. Well, it's you know, right. so as and as far as um, you know, uh, why religious uh, communities uh, said anything um, negative? There's no nothing in the Bible to suggest mm -hmm. that cannabis is taboo or forbidden or anything like that. So any religious uh, pronouncement on this is being made by uh, humans for their own purposes. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, when they put frankincense in the sensor and it goes, you know, and um, you know that frankincense has a THC anal analog. And I've experienced uh, burning frankincense, you know, smoking, when right. it smokes, um, and you know it does it it does change you now. Yeah. Can I? I'd like to get off of cannabis for a moment. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay, okay. So, you know, if you go into Europe, sure. in, in Europe they have these big cathedrals that are all, all awe-inspiring, and they have the stained glass windows and everything. Sure. So imagine in a time before there was radio, in a time before there was recorded music, when music only occurred when people were making it, because there were no recordings of it in the Middle Ages. And you say, why did all these poor people contribute to make these big, big temples of one sort or another? And it was like this. All week long, they worked bone hard because, you know, there was no machinery, there was no... Right. You, you know, they did. They, made, they had a little bit of water power and animal power, but that was it. So they were. Life was really hard. And then on Sunday, they'd come into this cathedral, and there'd be these strange people doing these unusual um, services in the front in a language that they didn't understand because it was all being performed in Latin. And they were in these great costumes that had a lot of color in them as compared with their drab clothing. Yeah. And the sun was, during the summer, the sun was streaming through those windows and uh, with all the color in it and, you know, the colored light. And, you know, 
we want color lights. We just turn a switch and we get colorful lights. But, you know, they just didn't have that. They, you know, like they hardly had light after dark. So, so the reason was, oh, and then they go around with a sensor and they get a little high from it. And the thing was, this was this giant, incredible entertainment that they looked forward to all week, not for its religious thing, but the awe of the colors and the, yeah. the, the sense. And, you know, there were all kinds of vendors outside. So it was like a carnival. And uh, the biggest entertainment was, was the church at the time. So that, that's, that, yeah. that's the whole thing, part of that. No, Another I, way of looking at it, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I'm going to move on to the back into the book in just a okay. second. Yeah. But the, <laughs> the last thing I... <laughs> no, we've alienated a good part, part of the audience. Right? That's <laughs> all right. That's all right. They'll, they'll, they'll forgive us, I think. I, I think a lot of the people that are listening in agree with us in general, probably about 90%. So I think, I think we're in good shape if we only lose 10. <laughs> but anyways, I, I keep 90 over 10 every time. But... <laughs> But anyways, my thing is, is, you know, you go to these other countries, like you said, Ed, and you can go and, you know, buy this stuff and it's, there's no, you know, people aren't going to chastise you. They're not going to call you a drug addict and anything else. But, you know, and it has become more accepted in this country, but there's still, and I believe this is mostly on religion. It's the people, and I have no, nothing against people that are religious. Uh, I, I, I will never say that. But there's a lot of people, like you said, they do these things, and it's all behind the scenes. They may be using cannabis, but they preach against it. You know, we've seen this in the Catholic Church. We've seen this in many different churches, that they say one thing, and then behind closed doors, they do the other. But my question is, why do you feel like it's so accepted in these European countries, and it's not a really, you know, fully accepted, I guess we should say, here in the U.S. Well, well I don't think that it really is accepted in Europe that much. Uh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, Holland w has been pulling back on its progressive, oh, wow. I progressive thing. I think it's about to become legal in, these, in a lot of the European countries. But as a matter of fact, a majority of people live in states where they can uh, legally buy cannabis uh, right. in the United States. And I, I don't think that it's considered a negative, negative that much. You know, on TV, it's joked about, nobody says, oh, it's too bad that person's using marijuana and look what happened to him. I mean, like, look at Bill Maher on TV. Right. Uh, and and other programs, and there are a lot of jokes about it. And right. I I don't see it as as consider being considered a moral failure any longer. Okay, well that's good. To and, hear. and I think people were just miseducated as soon yeah. as they came in contact with it. That is either knowing somebody who was using it medically or recreationally, and seeing it wasn't ruining their lives. Yeah. You know, my father-in-law said uh, to, to uh, me, uh, you know, you're talented in so many ways. Why did you get into marijuana? You know, the government could just go like that and wipe you out. And in fact, they did try to do that. But, uh, oh, wow. but he should have said, Ed, why are you in publishing? Yeah. <laughs> that would have been a better, that would have been right. a better question. <laughs> So, Ed, let's kick this around as we keep going into the interview. And if you want to find more about Ed, go to www.edrosenthal.com. Definitely check out the website. A lot of great information there. So, Ed, let's kick into the book. You yeah. talked a little bit about this earlier. And I know you have the copy and everybody can see that. It's right there. So, let's go into the book. Yeah. So, you talked about this a little bit earlier on in the interview of why you wrote the book and why you thought it was important. When we go into the dive into the book, as far as growing marijuana, because that's what this is kind of about, you know, what steps would you give the listeners that want to, you know, grow uh, cannabis in general to start off that process? 
Well, I think that they should read a little bit about uh, what the plant's needs are sure. and then uh, follow uh, a, a book's advice on how to meet those needs. And there are a lot of different ways of growing. There's no one way to grow that's better than everything else. So a lot of it has to do with uh, people's comfort levels. Are they comfortable with what would they like to do? How would they like to grow? And uh, uh, how much space they have to grow is another uh, consideration and what kind of space. And uh, cannabis is a really adaptable plant. It can be grown indoors or out. And so uh, that's what's described in the book, the different methods of cultivation. So for people that are listening, because there's people listening all over the country, and we even have people that listen in India and also in England, Australia too, which I don't know how they got a hold of this, but God bless them. I appreciate them listening. So a lot of these people do live in cold weather climates. Um, you know, I'm in Florida, so we have pretty good weather um, you know, most of the year in general. I know you're in California where you have pretty good weather most of the year too. For the people that don't live in those type of climates that we live in, and I know you said marijuana can grow indoors and outdoors, but what would you tell the people that live in those cold weather environments? Should they get like a, a greenhouse or how can they grow it when, you know, when it's snowing or real cold out in the spring or the winter? Well, most people who live in the United States or who live in Southern uh, Canada, uh, have a long enough growing season to uh, okay. to grow to grow plants um, to r ripening. So um, they may have to uh, adjust their techniques a little, but it can be grown outdoors almost anywhere in the U.S. And certainly, when if you use a greenhouse, that opens up yeah. that opens up the uh, the field a lot more because you can control the the uh, the environment so much better in a greenhouse. And also um, a lot of cannabis is grown indoors under lights. So, so you can use any of those, those methods. So go a little deeper into the book. You know, what do you hope that people get out of this book and really learn because it is a hot topic, like I said, and this business is really booming and a lot of people do want to get involved, but they don't know how to do it. Well, the purpose of this book is to show you how to grow. And right. it, I, know that it's a, I know that it's a long book, but it doesn't mean that you have to read the whole book. The, the first section of the book is about what the plant's needs are. Well, that's important about what the plants needs are and um, no matter whether you're growing a big garden or a small one indoors or out the plants needs are approximately the same so that's the first part and then the rest of the book is different ways of filling those plants needs depending on uh, what your goals are you know is your let's say you let's say you have a space outdoors and your goal is to just grow enough cannabis for your own needs. You could do, you know, you could do it the way um, you would grow any vegetable garden. I mean, each plant has different, slightly different requirements, but you could grow it within that context. And then let's say that you, that you were using it for other purposes, you might want to grow all year round. Well, you might want to grow all year round indoors or you might want to grow in greenhouses but however you want to grow we co we cover it in the book it's very comprehensive and it's all based on that same theme that no matter where you're growing the plant or how what techniques you're using it, the uh the plant uh, uh it, it can vary a lot but as long as you need the plants as needs which remain pretty stable. So Ed, obviously if you have the greenhouse, you can pretty much grow all year round for that matter. Like you said, you can control the environment. But if you don't have that greenhouse with all the seasons, when is the best season to start and grow? And I know every every place is different, obviously, because you know it's hotter in different places and, and not in others. But uh, usually people start 
uh, the plants outdoor and uh, indoors, uh, mm -hmm. just as they would tomatoes. Right. Uh, or cucumbers, they start them indoors and then transplant them outdoors as the season progresses. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it really depends, but usually plant, the plants are placed outdoors sometime in mid-May. And then uh, they're going to uh, grow for a while and then they'll start flowering in July or August and they'll be ready in September or October. Now, there are some plants that will uh, grow from seed to, uh, to ripening in 90 days. So, if, if, so, for instance, in Florida right now, you could plant them. They're called autoflowers, and you could plant them right now. 90 days later, you'll be harvesting the crop. So if you're in, let's say, the eastern part of the country, New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, in that area, obviously you get the snow, you got colder temperatures, and I know that obviously they have the summer. For the northern states, if the plant dies off, because obviously, you know, they do have those long cold snaps with the winter and even the uh, spring season. With that said, do the plants come back or they have to start over from seed? Well, uh, I I don't exactly see it that the way that you're interpreting it. Okay. And, uh, uh, what I see is that um, uh, people will uh, people should grow plants that will flower and ripen before the, the cold weather sets in, and right. there are about, literally hundreds and hundreds of seed of marijuana seed companies in the U.S. And they have thousands of different varieties of seed, and many of them are adapted to the particular area where they're growing. For instance, in New York, there are several seed companies, uh, and uh, there are in Georgia, in I don't know about Florida, but there are in so some southern states. And so you would get varieties that are pretty well adapted so that they come in before the harsh weather comes in. Thing. Thank you for saying that. You're you're informing me and the masses that are listening. So I appreciate that. And that's why you ha we have you on, Ed. As we go toward the end of the interview, you know, when you wrote this book and we kind of went through, you know, bits and pieces of it, what is that one thing that you hope people get out of it besides the growing part? Well, uh, it is part of the growing part. First of all, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun to grow right. because... You know, the plant grows from seed or from clone, you know, a little plant, to uh, ripening in a season. And you see the whole, the whole process. And uh, I say it's addictive. Like, I say uh, using marijuana may not be addictive, but growing it is. And it, it's just fun to do it. And yeah. once people do it, I, you know, you won't, I mean, this is hard to believe, but I know people who... Um, used to use marijuana. They don't use it anymore, but they grow it and they give it away to friends or do other things with it because it's so much fun to grow it. So it's it's just like um, you, you could compare it to, you know, it's a lot of fun to grow tomatoes, yeah. to be able to take go out to your garden and pull a ripe tomato off and sink your teeth into it. And this is sort of the same thing where you're providing for yourself, you're, you're, you're growing your own cannabis. And that's uh, so, uh, you know, it's uh, so spiritual in a way. And uh, so I, I think that um, that people will find that it's a pot, growing is, pot, not only using it as positive, but growing it is. Ed Rosenthal here on Fire and Breathe the Rub edrosenthal.com. Definitely check it out. That's where you can get the book. He has blogs on there. Definitely check out all that information. Ed, as we end the interview here, uh, just the last question, where can people find more about you, get the book, uh, social media, all that good stuff? Just put my name in Google and you'll get all of that. All that stuff will come up.
Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, or put it on uh, Amazon also if they want to get right. the book directly from Amazon. So yeah, can they build, buy that book off edrosendahl.com? Oh, yeah, and when they buy from there, uh, it's pers- I sign the book. And also, uh, we give them some free gifts all the time. Right now, we're giving away uh, a, a grow magazine and some Bovita, uh, you know, the uh, humidity controls. So we're giving those away and we give away different premiums at different times. We don't say what, uh, we don't always tell tell people that we're giving them right. premiums, but they come in the mail with, with the books. It's a good deal. It's a good book. And you yeah. get not just the book, like you said, you might even get a couple of surprise gifts. Yeah. So <laughs> sounds like a good plan to me. Ed, you did an amazing job today. I'm so happy to have you on because people need to learn about this. People need to get this book and really learn about it. It's a huge thing going on in America. And it's not just, it's not going to stop, I should say. It's just going to keep getting bigger and better. And it's a fun time for the people growing it, but make it into a family thing. You know, educate your family, educate your kids uh, so they don't (laughs) believe all the silliness that might be... being taught to them in the schools, the negativity. That, that, you know what? The, the, there are too many drug problems now. They're right. not concentrating on cannabis anymore. You know, in fact, you know, in New York State, uh, you know, it's it's just become legal there. But before mm-hmm. it was legal, they had a medical program. And if you had a prescription for opioids, you could use that to get cannabis. So, you know, they used to say that cannabis leads to other drugs, but opioids now are leading to cannabis. Well, that's great. I I think that's a great program that they had there. And they should do that all over the country because it's a plan. It's it's not a pill. It's a plan. And I trust it's, it's not a drug. It's an herb. Right, correct. So I I trust that more than I do of what the heck is in some of these pills. Not going to lie to you, there's some crazy side effects, and it just masks the problem. This is all natural. That was made in a lab. So you pick your own poison. I'll go with the natural. You can go with whatever you want. But anyways, um, any last words, Ed, before we uh, end the conversation today? Well, I want to uh, just once again mention to people that uh, growing cannabis is not difficult. You, yeah. It's fun to grow your own. And wa- just watch out because once you do it, when you do it once, you'll want to do it again. Right. Well, it's good to have people outside regardless. Yes. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get them outside and growing their own food, their herbs. Uh, and then many other things. So again, Ed Rosenthal, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. EdRosenthal.com. Definitely check that out and also get the book there as well. Ed, thanks for doing this. Let's do this again down the road. It's a really important Please. topic. Yes, let's do this. Yes.